Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Now today, I'm honoured to be speaking with performance psychologist Stuart Singer. Stuart, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Well, mate, why don't we get started by in you introducing yourself to the Sports Psych Show audience. Um, where have you been? What you've been up to? How have you got to where you are today? Wow. Where to begin? <laughs> uh, I think the... Uh, to get to the point as quickly as I can, you know, I, I started off as uh, really truly just wanting to be a coach. Uh, I was going to be a coach and a teacher, and that's all I wanted to do. Um, but realized that I really didn't have a subject that I wanted to teach. So, and what I realized is that what I loved about coaching was kind of the life lessons that happen. Uh, so, what I decided to do was get a master's degree in counseling, uh, became a counselor and a coach. And um, as I, I was doing that, uh, it just became more and more apparent to me that the the power of the mind. And so I became more and more interested in that aspect of coaching. Uh, and then finally, I think I was annoying my wife and, and uh, she was tired of hearing me talk about what if and maybe and someday. And she said, why don't you just do this? Go for it. Uh, th and that's what kind of led me to go back to, to get my uh, uh, education in, in performance psychology. And, and so I got my doctoral degree and uh, did my doctoral coursework in performance psychology. And um and, you know, it kind of progressed relatively quickly from there. I was kind of in the right place at the right time. Um, did, a, did a coaching clinic uh, where uh, a coach in the, in the WNBA in the, in the States, the Women's Professional uh, Basketball League, and uh, he liked what he ha had to hear and, and, uh, and ended up asking me to come and, and talk to the team. And, and things just kind of began to flourish from there. Um, and so that's kind of what, what brought me uh, to this space right now. 2019 was an absolutely phenomenal year for me and my work, um, I will say. I had a lot of success, but none was bigger than uh, working with the, um, with the Washington Mystics uh, in the WNBA also. And we, we won the, the world championship this year. So that was uh, an incredibly fulfilling experience. Um, and then that led to being hired by the Washington Wizards in the NBA. That's um, 2019 has been a nice year for sure. Fantastic. You mentioned being a coach. Um, was that was that a coach of a specific sport or were you sort of working across sports? Uh, I coached primarily uh, basketball and, and soccer or football. Um, those were my those were the two sports that I played and then uh, and then ended up that I got but but ultimately um one year I got roped into coaching cross country track um so uh, uh, you know uh, uh, anything I, I I found that coaching became I found out so much about how important it was to understand people rather than the sport sometimes interesting and and when you reflect back on your your playing days you said you played basketball you played soccer um did you have when you were playing and you were competing? Did you have any um, any ideas around performance psychology or sports psychology? Was it something on your radar? Did you utilize it at all back then, or not so much? That's a, a great question, and it's probably part of the whole. It, it, yeah, I, I had my my high school basketball coach gave us a um, article that he had copied out of a magazine on visualization, and at that point in my life, I had never heard of. And, you know, I had never heard of it. Uh, and I read the article. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fascinating. Um, he, he actually led us through, uh, one, one session, you know, we, you know, um, in a, I'm sure very rudimentary way. Um, but I did find it interesting. And, and then the other thing that I think I realized now looking back on it was that I had a pretty significant, uh, back injury to the point whereby, 22 had uh, disc surgery on, on, on my, which I think I really 
at least initially had herniated probably in my junior year maybe of high school and uh and the pain uh that I kind of lived with consistently I I don't think at the time I understood the impact of chronic pain from injury and trying to perform um still uh, through it. And I think those two experiences were the beginning of me, not completely, it didn't, you know, uh, coherently register that that's what I was interested in. But, but I think that was the beginning of being interested in it. And so when you did a master's degree in counseling at that time, you didn't necessarily see that as something that you could utilize within sport or was there a kind of an inclination towards doing that that counseling master so you can so you could actually bring it into the sports landscape yeah i i did and my thesis was on creating a, a a counseling program within the high school setting um so so i did have that but it, but ultimately i just thought no i, I wanted to be a, a coach I, to me at that point it was about sport mm. and at some point i transitioned to no it's about the mind and sport is the the vehicle that we that we're training, but we're really ultimately training the mind. It's interesting. So, so when you were doing your counselling masters, um, did you find that your capacity, your ability to coach, improved? Did you find that the all of the skills that you were learning, that, those collection of people skills that you were learning whilst doing that counselling masters, actually positively impacted on your coaching ability? A hundred percent. You know, there, there was a clear um, uh, crossover or enhancement, um, the ability to listen and truly listen. Uh, I think coaches, you know, it's a fine line. Um, coaches are, uh, at the end of the day, it's not, I, I say it's not a democracy. It is, it is, it is about a king. Uh, and, and, that has final rule. We don't vote on when, how many hours we're going to practice or coaches tell us and, and we must do. So there, there is a dictatorship to it, but, but there's a, such a fine line in being able to truly be able to listen and hear and, and recognize individual needs and motivations. And I think that that skill immediately, I wasn't bad at it. I think there was an intuitive, I mean, I think that we're all maybe somewhat drawn to the profession because there's also there's a potential intuitive understanding of that that we have, but I, I think it was enhanced for sure. So, learning those listening skills or improving those listening skills, I assume other skills, communication, the art of asking um, the right question or the most Im- impactful question, um, perhaps in those one 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 on one conversations just putting yourself empathizing with with people with players putting yourself in the shoes looking through the world looking at the world through the eyes of the player would those be the kind of skills that 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 sort of improved your coaching you know one of the most um one of the themes that began to to arise was that every season and and almost with every player, there would be a moment where the sport itself uh, drifted away and the, uh, the human condition became apparent. So whether it be there was a tragedy, unfortunately, within, the, within the, our team's family. Uh, and, and so all of a sudden sport became irrelevant, but the connection between the humans became powerful or an individual would have something that, that happened. Um, and in those moments, the bond and the connection that's created, then it just begins to then allow for everything else. The, that moment of understanding the difference between I'm coaching you because I want to win and I'm coaching you because I want you to find success and I'm caring about you, the individual. And, and I don't care what level, you know, that was at the point that was high school. But I, I honestly believe the same exact uh, emotions, uh, connections happen at the professional level as well. 
would you say that you know you've you've worked with a lot of coaches at all at all levels you know professional level the the, the college level mm-hmm. high school level would you say you know we're talking a lot of here about counseling techniques the connection between players between coaches and players in your experience would you say that coaches are so socialized into the X's and the O's they're social socialized into outcome and probably key performance indicators and things like that that they can tend to have a blind spot around the kind of things we're talking about here the, the psychosocial types of things I, I do because they're so easily measured I, I mean I obviously but I, I still believe that what differentiates the truly masterful um, is that they they whether they do it uh, intentionally or they like Jurgen Klopp to me just I, I don't know I'm not there but there seems to be a a magical connection that that he enjoys what he does he breathes that into the club uh, they enjoy playing. Uh, there's a belief. There's just fear, there's just something different, and I don't believe that it's just simply tactical. I, I don't. I you there's uh, you know again I'm not there, so what do I know? But but you know you you begin to see things that you understand, and and to me that's what makes him different. I think it's really interesting, you know, Stuart. I, you use this word intention or intentionality. And as you're speaking now, I'm just thinking about coaches and the best coaches I've worked with and the best coaches, as you're saying, you're using Jurgen Klopp as an example there. And I am i don't work with Liverpool. I don't work with Jurgen Klopp. Um, but, I, you know, certainly what we see on the outside and certain conversations that go on within the industry about what happens inside the club, there seems to be a great deal of intentionality there from that specific coach around the mm-hmm. mental side of the game. I wake up, I'm intentionally going to spend my day delivering mm-hmm. psych, psych socially, whatever mm-hmm. that looks like. Mm-hmm. Has that been your experience to some of the best coaches you've worked with? I, well, absolutely. Abs- and the funny part is it doesn't need to be the same for each. It just needs to be that intentionality, that, that, uh, Uh, continuity the consistency of how they show up with that being part of what they're about Um, uh, that it absolutely I mean to me again it's the it's the separation um, point for for the good to the great I think I think as well we I mean we're talking about coaches here but players I mean I find in my work and and, and, you know what there can be some divide here between sports psychs and performance psychs and mental skills Mm -hmm. coaches in terms of how they approach approach this I'm I'm actually quite in my work I'm quite active directive I I I want players to be intentional with the mental side of their game Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. within the performance arena uh, themselves whereas others are are maybe the the sports psychs, the performance psychs who might go down go might go down the path of uh, acceptance, commitment, mindfulness, that type of thing, which might be slightly less active directive. Where do you stand on that kind of intention from players <laughs> around psychosocial? Um, it's funny because I would say that I try to balance both. Uh, yeah. I have a very big I have a very big belief in. Uh, the power of uh, attention, uh, which to me is is mindfulness, is such a great. Um, I call it a workout for uh, attention, but then there has to be this proactive, um, intentional understanding of the place that you are when you are at your best. You need to understand you um, and and what what my emotion feels like, what do I sound like when I'm in that state, uh, what do I feel like, and, and you need to have practiced it proactively so that, just like you were talking about a manager showing up intentionally, I feel the athlete must show up intentionally. They must have an idea of what their great, not just looks like, but feel. what do they feel like when they're in that, and 
Because if not, I think we're just hoping. I think we're just hoping that we have what we want when we need it most. I agree. I, I, I love what you've said there. Yeah, a, a, a proactive, intentional understanding of you at your best. I think one of the most powerful questions I ask any athlete, any competitor is, t- you know, tell me about you at your best. What does that look like? Yeah. What does that feel like? What do others see? I just think that that's such a such a, an important question to ask a competitor to have them reflect on you know what it looks like what it feels like and do you find that sometimes even at high levels that they, when you ask that question there that it's a it's a pretty long pause that that that's something that they have not and some have don't get me wrong but but there are many times more often than than i would hope where where that question creates a hmm i've never actually thought about that exactly from that angle a hundred percent loads of times i mean probably mm-hmm. more often than not yes um probably more often than not and and funnily enough Stu, i spend my life doing this and when i was at a conference uh, I remember it about a year and a half ago, motivational interviewing, and we had to talk about our best day. Boy, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. I just thought, oh, wow, I ask this question all the time. I can't answer it myself. It was brilliant. Yes. It's funny because I, I think I could answer that now, uh, but but up to about a year maybe ago, I, I probably would have been extremely guilty as well. I've I've actually forced myself to do that same exercise, uh, probably because of exactly what you're saying. Yeah, no, ab- ab- absolutely. Do you f- do you ever have players who would say to you, who would re- who would answer that question in contrasting ways? I find this with golfers actually, and having been a pro golfer myself, I empathise with this. I I, I can. I, I see I see where this fits it happened to me because some days your best days you're in a certain emotional uh, state and a certain intensity level where you're perhaps trying really hard and in other mm-hmm. days you're in a different emotional state and you're perhaps a bit more relaxed yet both days you've played quite well and shot a great score and ultimately that actually drives a more complex scenario Mm-hmm. I don't yes. know if you've ever experienced that. I do. I have, and you know, it's funny because what I tr- the the way that I try to frame the question is not so much, you know, if it's a golfer, the, the score that day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's yeah. a if a if it's a footballer, not the goals, not basketball, not the points, but like legitimately how engaged how in you know uh how did competition feel and experience did you find those moments where you almost felt that you were in that state of flow or in the zone however you want to describe it and see if i can get them to understand the um what they might be able to consistently uh do rather than that day happened to be a great day uh, as best as possible but I've seen it very much, right? And it's so easy to go to those days where I shot my lowest round that day. Okay, so what? And, and, and to me, potentially, we might be trying to catch lightning in a bottle rather than saying, no, there are these things that we can try to line up. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that you had that same experience, you know, that you've had those experiences as well. Yeah, I, I think working with in team invasion sports, um, I, I don't find there's much of a conflict there in terms of best best days. Uh-huh. I, I agree with you when I'm saying best days. It's more to us, whether you call it the process or the habits or the behaviours or the affect, the feeling, the sensations. Um, I love what you've said there. I absolutely concur that you, you want to drive them down that path. I found in team invasion sports, I mean, I do a lot of work in, in football, s- soccer, a bit in basketball, but less so. So you're more experienced in terms of working with basketball than me. Um, 
Whereas in golf, there just seems to be that in, it's self-paced, that individual sport almost feels like it can be quite chaotic at times. It can be quite, well, I try really hard and I, you know, I feel good and I do well. I try yeah. less hard. I feel good. I, you know, I'm relaxed. I'm cool. I'm calm. I'm, I'm, I'm like Ernie Els walking down the fairway. And other days I'm like <laughs> Brooks Kepka walking down the fairway. And I think I'm the best in the world. And I think I'm untouchable and bulletproof. And both days work, both sensations and affect work. And that's where I found that quite complex. Whereas with team yeah. invasion sports, it's a little bit more, I'm sharp, I'm alert, I'm alive, I'm lively. You know, I'm head up, I'm scanning. I'm, and it's a little bit more predictable, if that makes sense. You know, what's interesting is that you say that for me when I'm with golfers or runners, because the score is the score and in in running the time is the time or swimmers the same way and i and i i agree with you that they 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 are a different those the between the team invasion or the individual sports where it's so much about you know for me i work very hard on for instance with golfers and you know swimmers runners to let go yep. of score yep. okay. uh, or let go of time and yet it's so hard not to be focused on those things because everything is about either your time if you're a runner swimmer or your score if you're a golfer. Yep, yep, yep. and and sometimes you just it, it is, it's enormously difficult. And when, and when you play in tournaments, especially in golf, where you've got the scoreboard placed strategically, yeah. usually in a place where you can see them best, and suddenly you see your score, and so that that can um, that can be off-putting. Oh. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. So. I'm intrigued by basketball and you're working with the Washington Wizards and the Mystics. You started with the Mystics and as you said in your int introduction, you had a fantastic 2019 and, and appreciating there's only so much you can talk about um, as, is, as, as is usual with performance psychs and sports psychs. What, if I may ask, you know, what, what's your primary role there? What might a day-to-day -day position there look like? What are you doing by and large? Is it more team? Is it individuals? Is it a bit of everything? Do you get involved from an organizational perspective? Absolutely, all of the above. All um, the above. I, I do do I do team uh, sessions. Uh, we do in, then do individual sessions for the players who are are interested and. In, um, uh, with the, with the mystics, uh, be, I would be in staff meetings, um, and do consult sometimes with coaches, uh, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, with the mystics in particular, about five years ago, we really decided that we wanted to look at the impact of culture, uh, and, 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 and that became a, a study of what, what do we want this to look like? We, what do we want this environment to be about? Um, and so the, you know, winning is always wonderful, but, but the, the journey on this one was so special because it was a, a, it was a process. It went from not so great to okay, to make the playoffs, to make a final, but lose in the final and get swept in the final. So it wasn't even really close to then finally this year um, win it. And, and that progression and watching the character of the individuals and the character of the coaching staff and the, the real honest, I'm going to use the word love. We don't do it often in, in sports, but I'm going to use it. There was a true love between the players to one another. The, the, I think the coaches to the players, the players to the coaches, it was, it was exactly the way a championship should feel, which they don't always feel uh, that way. And, and it, this did, it culminated in the exact way that it should feel. And I think that that was uh, uh, a beautiful thing. And so with the Wizards, it's a, it's a much bigger organization. Uh, so the, so the, the players are different, but, but the idea is still very similar as trying to do the in, impact from a, a group perspective, but also uh, in, on an individual perspective as well. Going back to the Mystics, you said over five years there had been uh, work had been done on the cultural side. You must have seen shifts that 
eventually led a shift in process, shift in attitude, shift in, I suppose, mental skills, shift in uh, the environment, the feeling of the, the, the feeling, the affect, the emotion around the organization. This year you won. So as you said, you, you, you've, you've seen change. What, again, appreciate what you can and can't say. Um, right. But what do you feel have been some big shifts? What if I had gone in five years ago and observed for a few days, right? And then I'd come in in 2019 and observed for a few days. Are there any overt signs or even look subtle signs that I would have seen that would look different? And, and what kind of things might you have engaged in that you can talk about that led to that change or those changes? I think the biggest shift that you would see, and, and I want to preface all this with, you know, I really did. I love the, the, the individuals that were a part of it five years ago. You know, it, was, it wasn't that they, anyone was, there wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad people. It's a bad mix, let's say, or it was not the mix that creates it. And I think that if I could share with, with players, with players, actually, most, the, the biggest shift was the ability to love other people's success. I think it's so easy, especially in professional sports, and, and it, you could be, it, it, it certainly doesn't change that much going, you know, coming, working backwards, but it's so easy in professional sports to, to want it to be about what, what am I getting, um, you know, whether it be time or obviously money <laughs> and contract mm-hmm. and, and, Watching this group truly love the other person's success. I mean, everybody wants their own. I mean, and I don't think there's something inherently wrong with that. Um, but there was a true like happiness when so, when someone had a great game. It was a celebration of them. It, it, it wasn't like, well, why am I not getting that that moment in the sun today? It wasn't that. And I think if if I was going to name one inherent change that w- that would be noticeable would be that type of absolute, I don't care who it is today, I just want us to be successful and I'm happy to celebrate somebody else's success. Which for me is working quite heavily in British soccer is one of the big challenges because if yeah. you've got, at, and, and I'm talking about the adult elite level here, of course, um, if you've got 25 players on a squad, for example, and as Arsene Wenger, the, the ex-Arsenal manager used to say, well, I have to uh, make, I don't know, uh, 10 of them unemployed on a sat- on a weekend, you know, so <laughs> yeah. or, or, or seven of them because 18 are traveling. Yeah. That makes up the squad for the traveling, uh, for, for, for traveling to the game. Um, that's a, an enormous challenge is, is to take the individuality out of the culture because everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to be in that team. Um, mm-hmm. And so helping people, helping create a culture an environment where others are happy for the players who are absolutely actually competing that's tough to do uh, it's i think it's brutally tough and i think that there are days where it's obviously uh doesn't happen i, I mean the one thing that you know i i try to be very honest about both with the uh, with the athletes that i work with and with if i'm speaking you know is that Let's not make this seem like like we have this end all answer that makes every day wonderful. It's not like that. There are going to still be bad days. There are still going to be moments where our ego and our uh, uh, um, envy get the best of us. Uh, what we're trying to do is help build those um, daily intentional skills that allow us to have fewer of those days and when we do have those moments do we know what to do once they're now getting the best of us and and i'm you know i'm i'm uh, I'm, i was going to use the word guilty but i don't wouldn't even call it that i don't i feel like i do all the skills that i ask of my athletes uh, for myself on a daily basis. And that does not mean that I can tell you that I never have a day where my envy or my anger or my ego get the best of me. Um, and I've been 
you know, as, as you said, we're, we're in this 24 seven for a long time. And so this is what we do. This is what we discuss. This is, we, we know the ins and outs, we know what's happening and we still have days where it's, it's not going to be our best. And I'm okay with that. Uh, and I think the athletes should be okay with that. Um, but we don't want to have that turn into two days, three days, four days, five. You know, the, the goal is to minimize, not to say we're going to be perfect. The word that springs to mind as you're speaking is vulnerability. And for me, it's accepting that people are going to be vulnerable. It doesn't matter that they got incredible skill in their hands or an amazing skill in their feet these players are still people and yeah. people are vulnerable now vulnerable is a, is a strongly emotive word right and when i say vulnerable as you're describing it's a day where you get a little bit envious or a bit egotistical or a day where your attitude however you want to define your attitude is isn't quite there um that's for me that's okay and I, and I do think externally and I and I experienced this on Twitter and especially Twitter f- f- for sound bites and hey I do a lot of sound bites and maybe I'm guilty here is that you know we give the impression that elite adults so top level sports organizations your premier mm-hmm. leagues your mlbs yep. your mbas it, it we kind of give the impression like everybody has this incredible attitude all the time and everyone's perfect <laughs> and everyone's giving it a hundred percent attitude energy and effort and for yeah. me Stuart, i think that, that moving forward we need to embrace vulnerability we need to understand that players are people and people are vulnerable and actually so that vulnerability doesn't stretch into a second a third a fourth day a week actually allowing players the space to be vulnerable is important because then we really can help them manage how they feel manage their attitude manage their behaviors yes i think i've seen you and this this is something that i think we we share uh, very deeply is that have you seen the 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 it, typically it'll be on Twitter where you control this and it's my attitude my energy my e- and 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 I'll be honest I feel like I was guilty of that at one point and and I think I think I've seen you mess you know message this and I know that I feel the same way as no I do think we can deeply influence those things but they are not the starting point of those is different on a daily basis. So to say that we're going to show up with a hundred percent great attitude or great effort or great energy isn't we're working towards those things. And we do have some pretty good influence in those things, especially again, if we understand ourselves and we understand these intentional skills and habits that we can, that we can proactively train, but to suggest that they're always going to be at a hundred percent, just because we to control, to control means that they will be 100% every single time that we flip the switch. And to me, that's not the human condition. Uh, absolutely, Stuart. And it's so emotive to me now because I, I feel that um, organizations, teams hold themselves back. And the coach-athlete relationship can be damaged by this because I just feel, and I've started to call this the difference between 20th century coaching messages and 21st century coaching messages i think in the 20th century 20th century we were very much 70s 80s and 90s we were very much you can control your attitude you can control your effort and it was very much the coach insisting on it you know i I insist and it's that external locus of control isn't it? it's that classic attribution theory of you know you the player are responsible for this now clearly players have responsibilities i understand that Ooh, and, yeah. and clear i completely agree with you control is such a strong word it doesn't mean i don't want players to take charge of themselves it doesn't mean i think if we've got a continuum there that it's acceptable that they're down at 20 percent attitude and effort and energy that's not what i'm saying but what i'm saying is part of the coaching toolbox part of the the team's toolbox where everybody's in it together is we accept that human beings are vulnerable they are human beings as you said the human condition which i think is a great way of putting it and part of our responsibility as coaching staff together as leaders and as players is to help each other um 
manage vulnerability, manage the human condition, and 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 give ourselves the space for for strategies, tools, techniques, philosophies, processes that helps us as close to that hundred percent as possible. Hundred. That's exactly. And 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 I think. I, I think I've seen you mention the idea of that it's a co-ownership. It's a co-ownership. And if we if we start to look at it that way, and I agree with you, this is not to suggest that there's zero ownership in any way. And that there are days where, as you also mentioned, it, we, we, we try to frame, look, look at, to, I just put something with Drew Brees on my, on my uh, Twitter, I believe. And, and as, as, as Hall of Fame and wonderful as I'm sure he is, and but I'm sure there are days where he shows up that he doesn't want to be there, that that his body doesn't feel the way he wants it to, that his outside life is gets in the way in some way, shape, or form. That's that's the human side of us, and we cannot rip ourselves away from that that part of it. But what I would also argue is on those days, we do still need to come in and perform just like you and I on the days where we don't feel it still. And but if if we're working with a team or an individual, we still have to give them our best that we can give them that day, which might not be my very best. But it, but I must I must still show up and perform. But I, you know, I, I said something the, uh, to, a, to a coach the other day where they said we c- I can't give confidence to an athlete. And I said, I, I think that's fair, but I also think it's fair that we can certainly take it away or we can certainly work against it uh, and that there are people showing up that aren't all at the same starting line. So if the starting line is different, we may have to give someone a little bit more time, a little bit more attention or think a little bit more deeply about what's going on with that individual that day. So while I agree that we can't turn it over to someone, that they have to do their portion of the work. We also, we also can hinder it for sure. And so it's got to be this connection between both, not, not one or the other. I really love what you said. And, and let's just dwell a bit on the Drew Brees thing you put up, the video. And that was a video mm-hmm. of him um, doing some... Men- now, you, you're going to help me here because I'm a, a, an Englishman who I really love American football, or if, if I may call it American football, I love uh, football. Yep. But my knowledge of it is, is, is it isn't what it should be. So what I saw was somebody taking a, uh, a mobile phone video of Drew yeah. Brees on his own, indoors, sort of re- mentally rehearsing, but also physically rehearsing. So mentally rehearsing as he's physically rehearsing the playbook that he's probably going to have to go through on game day. Would that be right? Yes, correct. That's how I would yeah. Yeah, and 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 you put something up about visualization. I completely agreed with it. I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's fantastic. He's going through the physical process and imagining what's in front of him. In the ideal scenario, there's 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 you know teammates in front of him. However, you know you can't always do that. So he's clearly doing that 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 extra bit. And deciphering for me what you've just said in terms of the 100%, maybe against the 95%, you said, I can't be 100% all the time, but I still have to be responsible. I still have to, whether you call it enacting the behaviours, I still have to be as present as I can be. I still have to um, do the things that, you know, uh, a sports psychologist, a performance psychologist should be doing. I would imagine that Drew Brees, as you said, might have days where he knows he's got to do that. He knows he's got to do that extra half an hour, 45 minutes. He might just on days not do it quite as well and as thoroughly and as focused, as attentive, as intense as other days. Yes. And for me, you know, I, I, I think the way I actually framed it was that going back to kind of piggyback what you were saying about what image we create. I don't want to create an image, actually, that if you now do 30 minutes of visualization after practice, that you'll now be Drew Brees or any other elite, elite outlier athlete. It's good for you, but it doesn't mean you're going to get out. And the other part is there are plenty of elite outliers that have never done it. So I don't, so to, I, I hate what we suggest that there are these 
if you just do what 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 so and so did or does, you will now become so and so. That's not that's not accurate. But what I do think that you can take away is that, and in fact, what I took away from it was that this is someone who is considered one of the all time greats. Who, in my estimation, was was done with the actual physical work and now was getting themselves into this intention again to me that then talks to the intention of where he wants his mind to be as much as the physical the, to me the physical was done at that point now he was being intentional about this is my mental preparation um, and that to me is the message and whether we ever achieve at that level is <laughs> there's a lot of other factors that are going to have to come together to make that happen but but the intentionality of what he's doing, I think we all can take away. It's interesting as you're talking there, because I'm thinking, you know, you've, you've, you you use the term confidence and intentionality. And recently I've been pondering the notion that confidence is positive intent. It is positive intent. When I stand by the side of a pitch watching soccer players play a small-sided game of keep ball, the ones who are really who look confident are executing with positive intent. When I think about executing a confident golf swing, I'm doing it with positive intent. And I've been pondering recently this idea of, as you're talking about, you know, athletes, competitors need to go onto that pitch or court or course and execute with positive intent. And in many respects, if they do that deliberately, if they do that intentionally, without overthinking, but if they do that deliberately and intentionally, then that is one way for them to execute with confidence it's, it's, or, or to build confidence. It's, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to execute with positive intent. Whether I complete my passes or not is one thing, but that's, that's my primary objective here. And when you, so if you say positive intent, you mean to make the successful play rather than to prevent the possible negative from happening. Is that, is that how you would frame that or no? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that um, if I'm lacking confidence, I'm going to execute inhibited. Yes. So if I yes. think on the golf course, I can swing, I can steer and guide. If I think about the soccer players I watch, you know, they might eat, they can even try and steer and guide a pass. Um, whereas when I execute an action with positive intent, you know, it's just a, a real, it's a, it's, it's a motor behavior that's executed with, with freedom, yes, but it's a real towards rather than away. It's to complete the pass rather than to not miss the pass, if that makes sense. Yes. That's, no, that's, exa- that's what I was trying to frame. Yes, that's exactly the way. Yeah. It's a hard space to be. That, that, and, and that goes back, that goes to me back to if we haven't proactively done reps mm. of what that positive intent looks like and feels like. It's almost impossible to be that on a regular basis, especially when the atmosphere is as stressful and 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 pressure filled as certainly in, in, in the EPL is going to be or any of the leagues that we've mentioned. Like you're not going to be able to it, it would be it would like be it would it would be like me saying, hey, I'm going to drop you in the middle of the ocean and I want you to swim but you've never done it in a pool where if worse comes to worse, you could stand up. Yeah. It, it won't, yeah. it, it, it's just not that simple. And, and so why we would expect that without that, that proactive intentionality is that's the part to me where I feel like we're still not where we need to be in, in the performance world until we truly understand that. And everybody's on board with that. I think that's the, that's the gap that we still have. Is there anything that you do with coaches and or players to help promote that, that, that intentionality? Do you mean to help that understanding or while if I'm working individually with an athlete, how do I do it? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I do think one of the things that if I'm working with, a, with an organization, with a team, 
I, I really do try to have as many uh, off the cuff, con- just conversations when we're eating or when we're hanging, you know, hanging out or sidelines, you know, uh, and, and the deeper we can have conversations about all this, the more, um, the more that I think it becomes, oh, let me understand that a little bit more deeply. So I, I do that and I'll do that with players and coaches alike. Um, when I'm working with players, for sure, my, my, you know, I, I, I would say that I probably have a, at this point, a little bit of a, a system, you know, everybody's unique, but, but, you know, I, I really believe heavily in athletes understanding that, that there is a science of the brain. So, you know, like this, we we're so accepting of, of science from the neck down, but somehow uh, we, we think that there are some hacks and gimmicks for, for the mind. And I try to say, well, you know, under pressure situations, the brain has a very specific system that it wants to protect you. And, and so, you know, if we don't understand our, our, our amygdala, if we don't understand our, our, our lizard brain, we, we're, we're, we're probably not going to be in control of it. And, and that's okay because it serves a very important purpose in other situations, but in sport. So I, I try to get that understood. So once we have a layer of that understanding, then I do try to go to the idea of understanding. Um, I call it uh, either conscious intentionality or my best self. What is my best self and how do I look, feel and, uh, and sound in that? And then we rep that. We do repetitions of seeing it, discussing it. Uh, what are my words that I might you know, use and, you know, the mantra words that I might, you know, I, I have one player who, who says this, uh, next ball and find space. If he can, no matter how bad he's playing, next ball, find space. That immediately clicks him into, okay, now, I, and, and if you have to do that, and that's the other thing I explained, you may have to do that a hundred times during the match. It, it, you, you may lose that space often. And you may need to bring yourself back to that space. So that's the way that I do that. And um, you brought up mindfulness and you and I have kind of touched on mindfulness in the past. And, Mm. you know, that to me is where mindfulness. So on its own, I think it's it's nice. it's, It's healthy, but it's not the be all end all. But what it is powerful for, for me at least, is the idea of. What am I paying attention to right now? And how often can I make, you know, as best as we can, that my attention isn't on the worst and is hopefully on the best? And and if I have to do that over and over again, then that's what I have to do. But it does train that skill set. And that's how I – so that's how I probably try to get it – uh, an athlete in particular, in this case, into that mind space. What I find really interesting and really parallels with my work and parallels with maybe conversations and debates I've had in the past with people is this idea, you know, you said you've got a player who has uh, a mantra, uh, a cue sentence, if you like, of yeah. ne- uh-huh. next ball find space next ball find space and you said to him you know you might have to return to this a hundred times in the game and i just think that's such a a pertinent point because i think that is that historically has that notion has been neglected in sport that that the assumption is i'll blank your mind clear your mind and just go play and that's yeah. the best state to play in, which to me is its too strong to say it's baloney because everyone's got their viewpoints and experiences. But I'm a big believer in thought in action, not just, oh, clear your mind. I understand that we probably don't want 5,000 thoughts. But yeah. if we use the term flow or zone, uh, you yeah. know, the, the, a misunderstanding of that is, oh, it's no thought at all. It's, as you said, you're going to be distracted out there and there are times you've got to snap yourself back in and you know what it's not just times it's possibly a hundred times yes and and how and that comes back to your intentionality i'm going to my intent 
is to stay switch on, at switched on out there. My intent is to pay attention, and that means I've got to come back to next next uh, ball, um, find space, or whatever it might be. You know, a hundred percent. And I think that I mean, if you think about a, a ninety minute match, who who in the world can pay attention to anything? for 90 minutes straight, which we know it's more than 90 minutes. But but then I always say this, think about how many moving parts there are. So you have you have 11 to a side, so we have 22 players. We have a center ref, we have our, our, our ARs on the side. We have, and then we have a massive stadium around us. The weather changes uh, by, by the minute, right? The pitch can change, a bad call can happen, a bad touch is made. They, there are so many things that are out of our control completely in that setting that to suggest that we're going to be for 90 straight minutes on, on either a completely clear mind, which we actually know we never truly have a completely clear mind, or that it's going to be always where we want it is I think, I think that creates more stress. I want to I wanna allow my, my athletes to understand you're human yep. and your attention is going to ebb and flow a little bit. Your emotion is going to ebb and flow a little bit. But do you know where you want to get back to? And then have we done enough proactive, you know, intentional work to get us to that space more often and for longer period of time, uh, yep. knowing that we're not going to be perfect? I like that idea of ebb and flow. I love that idea of players giving themselves permission for their attention to ebb and flow, for their intensity, emotion to ebb and flow a little bit. Is there room for that in basketball? I just I, I picture the playing surface surface in say soccer and the expanse yeah. of the pitch and there's yeah. there's room for it, but it can lead to problems. I almost feel in basketball where there's that that there's less room because of the, the the lack of room, if you like, on the playing surface. Yeah, the quick answer, yes, and I'll explain why I say yes. Yeah. The 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 opposite. So I agree with you, and but basketball is much more stoppage. Yeah. Right. There's okay. you know a foul happens and it takes a little bit of time. The ball goes out of bounds and it takes a little bit of time. We have timeouts. We. We stop the play often. So there's all these moments to be able to regroup, essentially. Uh, and the, the other part of it is, is that we, so the, in a, again, in a perfect world, the answer would be no, you don't want, you don't ever want to leave, leave that space. But it's, to me, that's all, it's so, it would be, it's almost acting as if we're going to be perfect. And I, I, I don't think that that's good for any of us to 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 think that we were going to be. And so, what I try to do, because and and in particular, um, there are statistics in in certainly the WNBA, and I, I think the NBA has a similar, is that most games come down to I want to say a uh, five point uh, most, and so that's really just two possessions, right? That's two times out. Of a, a big game where we're, we're probably talking about anywhere from 80 to 100 possessions. So now you're, and, and so what I'm trying to explain to our teams are okay, if you feel you were fouled and you don't get that call, and now you want to get angry and complain and you want to stay stuck in that, how many potential possessions are you losing? So it is about getting it back quickly. But I, I still think to ask anything more than, you know, to, I, I just think there's going to be those times uh, yeah. where we're still human, you know. How have you found attitudes towards sports psychology, performance psychology within basketball? You, you will have an experience and it's just an experience from the teams you've worked with. And, you know, working in the NBA now, what's, what's the player attitude and the coach attitudes like? I think that it is certainly continuing to move in a positive direction. Yep. Uh, if you would have asked me the question 10 years ago, it would have been different than it is today. So I have definitely seen, seen positive movement. Uh, and 
at the other end of it, I would say that there, you know, that will forever, not forever, I hope, uh, but, but I do think that there's always going to be uh, a little bit of that stigma that we, that uh, vulnerability equals less than uh, instead of, you know, in a way, I try to frame vulnerability as strength. The moment that I'm willing to say I, I want something very badly, so if I, if I acknowledge, if I say to you, I want this and it will hurt if I don't get it, if I don't achieve that, that makes me vulnerable, correct? I've, I've, now, I've now basically laid myself bare, but to me, that's powerful strength to say I want something, I know it will hurt, and I'm still willing to go for it. That is power. Not, but, but it, there is a vulnerability in that as well. Because the open acknowledgement of knowing that something that I want badly could, the downside of that is if you want something badly, it will hurt to not get that or achieve that. But I still think that that's a place of power. Uh, and, and I feel like that's the, once, once we clear that hurdle, I think we're, we'll be then at least on the downhill side of it. We'll be we'll be going with momentum at that a, a great momentum at that point. You've referred to the vulnerability piece there, and I, I don't want to return too much to vulnerability, but I agree, Stuart. I mean, I, I, for me, my headspace nowadays is if we're if if the team, the organisation I'm working with are admitting vulnerability and accepting vulnerability i think we've got more chance to be successful than if we're punching the air and telling everybody that we can achieve anything personally you know i i I think yeah let's punch the air and say we can achieve but within that let's let's accept that players are going to make mistakes players are going to have down days players are people etc etc yeah do you feel within that basketball community as an example that coaches and players are better at connecting up the dots between their movement and actions and where they place their focus of attention how they're feeling uh, what emotions they're experiencing because that's what I felt over the last two decades is that some people whether they're players or coaches struggle to connect up the dots probably struggle to see it the psych social as the driver of the tech tech and physical side of the game i would agree that it's people based sport or gender or anything i i feel like there are certain individuals that just inherently and or not even inherently but have come to under, understand it over time yeah and, and ones that are, as we started this, some of this conversation around with no it, it, X's and O's, uh, you know, drives everything. And if, and if we can, if we can do this exactly the way we put it up on the board, we'll be successful. And, and so there's just, that has so much more weight. And, and I think it still is very individually driven, at least from my experience. How would, do you find it? Do you find that to be similar? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I I think there's a remix of attitudes out there. I, I think yeah. that, and, and, and I think, I'm positive. I, I think that, I think the challenge for our industry has been, and I've talked quite a bit about this on the Sports Psych Show, obviously, and on podcasts, and I think the challenge has, has been that we, if there's a continuum, sport and performance psychology has tended to be on the far right hand side if that's the the, the the side we're going to talk about which maybe can be a bit too theoretical but I, I i still think we need to be better at what we do to help to continue to demystify to continue to scaffold yeah. down our ideas our tools our strategies yeah. and then of course there's been on the far left hand side which has been again the fluffier side the self-helpy guru uh, you know, oh, we're going to get in a motivational speaker at the beginning of a season, and right. wow, we're bound right. to win. You know, most of our games right. as a consequence right. of this very inspiring speech, and I, you know, so so, and I, I think we have to try to hit the middle ground. You know, I think we can inspire. I think we can punch the air and and say we can achieve. I think we can talk about no limits. I think we can be optimistic, even mindless optimistic at times. Like, why not? 
But I also think we need to be grounded in yeah. science and help our colleagues, coaches, yeah. players understand that science, understand the methodologies that underpin the tools and the techniques, if that makes sense. And get them passionate about those techniques. Get them passionate, as you said. I love what you said about you know players who are passionate about next ball, find space, and understand that's just a cue. I'm just directing my attention, you know. And yes. that's as you said, a skill that can be developed and developed and developed. I, I could not uh, say it any better. My belief is is that our jobs must be at some point applicable if i'm not helping you on the field on the court in the pool on the you know uh track then what is this and i I, it's not about me trying to be the smartest guy in the room who cares that that doesn't it it, what what does that do I, i i want to at some point be able to like you know when you said scaffold it down i want to be able to take that really maybe theoretical, maybe relatively complex idea and scaffold it down so much that everybody that I'm talking to understands it. And then most importantly says, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that when I'm in that moment of complete emotional uh, turmoil. When I'm out there, I can do that. And if I'm doing that, then I feel like I'm doing a good job. You know, it's, it's gotta be that just like all of coaching has to be that really. Well said. Well said. Stuart, thank you so much for your time, mate. Yeah, it was great. I love this. It was fun. How can... I know you would have tapped the interest of many of the listeners, so um, how can people find you, follow you? Are you on social media? Can people get in contact with you? If so, how can they do that? Um, yeah, uh, Instagram and Twitter, I am at, at wellperformance one word um and uh yeah to reach out my my website uh, is uh wellperformancecoach.com and uh certainly you can reach me there um and i as i as as i say uh to all uh, around kind of the topic that that we're discussing is that i hope that everything that i put onto my social media will match up with the discussion that we had and be grounded in actual science. If, uh, you know, I I always say this, Cristiano Ronaldo might say something that works for him, but, but he is an outlier of outliers of outliers. So unless what he says matches up with what I understand is grounded in science, I'm not going to put that onto my social media and say, now you try that. Hey, who am I to say anything to, to, to refute what he might say? Mm. But at the end of the day, I don't feel good about putting anything on my social media that's not going to be grounded in, 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 a, in some type of science that we understand. Um, so I hope that that's what I do uh, when I put things on there. Um, yeah, so that's how to find me and that's uh, where to follow. Brilliant. And, and before I let you go and get on with the rest of your day, I know that you uh, have, have recently released an app or created an app. Why don't you just, oh, yeah. before you go, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I created uh, an app about a year and a half ago now um, that is, uh, it, it uses what I would call um, some of the, the topics are, are the, my most essential, the ones that I probably talk about and discuss the most with with athletes and teams um and then it does use mindfulness as as the uh, i call it mindset workout of how to how to kind of build that attention to the skill that it discusses and so that's how the the app works it's a daily app it's 10 minutes a day it's called do so d-o-s-o um one word and as of right now it is only in the app store so all android users it is in the works but it is not there yet and i apologize but you can find it in the app store right now you'll get um I, I will get there the the like i said it's doso it's uh it's a play on the latin phrase uh non do so do so uh which means i am not let i lead so the idea of i'm not going to let my thoughts take me down whatever path or my emotion i'm i still have the ability to 
to redirect. Um, so that's the idea. I like it. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Oh, I'm going to dominate oh, me. Or at least, at least I can attempt to be in charge. <laughs> I can attempt to be well said. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us, mate. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed that podcast. Um, we covered a lot of ground there. Really, really interesting. Um, and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, thinks. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me exactly what you think of the Sports Site show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.